And so, yeah, today I'm just doing some analysis of games I previously played. Um, yes, I will be using the Lee Chess interface to do this. Um, no, I don't really expect to be playing games on Lee Chess uh, during the course of doing this. So, um, with that said, hopefully I can do this without interruption from Lee Chess. And that's why I'm choosing not to put Lee Chess in the stream title, is that sure, this is chess content, sure, it's going to be performed on Lee Chess. Um, however, it really doesn't have much to do with the site, and it's just me looking at games. Um, so that might not appeal to everybody. Certainly wouldn't appeal to the bullet audience that's on here. But those of you who do follow me might appreciate it, so I'm, that's my plan here. Um, that all said... Uh, let me um, set up some background and just talk about how the tournament went. Okay, I'm inserting a dramatic pause because I expect that sometime around now is when I'm going to actually cut to start the, um, my highlight. Let me make one last change here, and I'll get started. <laughs> All right, so a few weeks ago, I played... Let me start over. A couple weeks ago, I played in an over-the-board tournament. And you know how periodically you guys will ask me, what's your rating? What's your rating? And I'll just keep telling you, my rating is somewhere over 1,900. I really don't play over-the-board a whole lot. Um, in general, the whole competitive scene, I don't know, I just find it really competitive and, I don't know, just really quiet and not very nurturing or very interesting. I'd much rather um, participate in collaboration with chess than competition. And that's just my personal preference. But, you know, from time to time, um, it is necessary for me to go compete in tournaments and see just, like, how I do and have some fun. And, you know, if there's not a whole lot at stake, um, maybe it's a more enjoyable, more casual, friendly sort of event. Um, that can be a lot more enjoyable than, say, grinding out a particular middle game or end game for several hours. So, uh, I played it, I guess what people would call a rapid time control. Um, I'm trying to remember what the time control was. I think it was game 60 plus 5 second delay. I could be making that up. Maybe it was game 75, maybe it was game 90. It was something on that order. And so the games did go fairly quickly. We got the whole tournament done in a single day. Um, and with that, uh, I'll walk you through the tournament games one by one here. So here we go. All right, so, oh, round one, I'm playing black. How do I flip the board? There we go, board is flipped. Um, please ignore the annotations in the margin. I apparently have no way to turn these off. Um, oh, let's turn off computer arrows and computer gauge. I've never done this before. Okay. Wait, what's this delete button do? No, I don't want to delete the game, just the analysis. But there's no way to turn that off, but that's okay. So yeah. Um... Here we are. This is my round one game. Um, I forget, this was probably 9.30 or 10 in the morning. For whatever reason, I wasn't completely, totally awake at the start of this game. Hey, welcome, Elsie. How are you doing? I'm just covering how my last tournament that I played in went. And believe it or not, I have played in an over-the-board event. Uh, I'm trying to count. Maybe that was just a single event in the whole last year. 
Anyhow, this is a more friendly, kind of rapid event. I think it was the time control was game 60. And um, I was, if not the number one seed, the number two seed. Uh, my section had eight people in it. Um, so the pressure is on me to not mess up and uh, to try to play as accurately as possible and not just be exploitative and try to play well and reimmerse re myself back in the over the board scene you know in case um, local tournaments or clubs or whatever want me to participate in their events yeah now this is a couple weeks ago um, so anyhow we start the tournament um, wish everybody good luck actually our round starts a little bit in advance of the main section even though we're in the same room just because the main section, I think, was a four-round event, and ours was a three-round event, and um, still our section took longer than the main section. So things were a little bit noisy, a little bit casual and fun. And I find that a little more entertaining and enjoyable than, say, um, if everybody's really competitive and quiet and... I don't know. This is a really well-lit room. It was really, in some ways, comforting to play there. Um, I've played in money events eh, where there's big prizes and there's fluorescent lighting and you can hear a pin drop in the tournament hall and you see all kinds of players show up there. Um, it's much more fun playing in these community sort of events even though they tend to attract uh, a lot of really young players who um, don't have this concept of volume control. Anyhow, let me get started. So, um, oh, I don't hear any sound. Let me turn on sound. All right, let me try that again. C4. So my opponent leads off with an English, and immediately I'm taken back because I expect like most players over the board from where I'm around tend to prefer other first moves and so my reaction here I mean I've studied to some extent I've very in a very shallow sense I've studied a number of openings and I, I was trying to like flip through everything I knew here so um, what I'm most familiar with are c5 um, c6 intending d5 um knight f6 and um g6 these are really the four major options that came to mind uh to me during the game um looking at it back again right now e6 also comes to mind and this is something I'd actually want to study more and play in more games. However, this does tend to transpose into the Queen's Gambit declined. And that's something that lower rated players are at least somewhat familiar with. And I was trying to avoid uh, something that my opponent might just completely know. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, so I'm trying to think, like, Move one, I'm playing against somebody against whom I'm like a 500 rating point favorite. And so, I mean, that's partly to blame on the rating system. And maybe it's possible that this player's improved since their rating got to that level. I don't know. Maybe I'm overrated. I don't know. There's a lot that can't be known at this point. But what I do know is that I'm gonna feel embarrassed if somehow I do manage to mess this up. Um, and that's just human nature here. And I mean, it's nothing for me to worry about and it's just a number, but still it feels icky if I play against a player and they haven't demonstrated some sort of skill so I want to be able to test my opponent. I don't want him to be able to regurgitate things he's played before. And so to that end, I do go knight f6. And I'm trying to take my opponent out of book as quickly as possible. And he plays g3. And at this point I'm thinking, okay, well, 
he's probably aiming for some sort of ready setup where he plays like bishop g2, knight f3, and um, he's got knight f3 and c4 played. And so at this point I recognize he's probably well within his knowledge and there's really nothing I can do to take him out of that. And this is really good practical play by a person who um, really doesn't need to know every opening. Like if he'd played something more combative, like if he'd played, I don't know, he could have played d4, he could have played knight c3 intending some kind of conflict in the center. Um, if he plays something that's more aggressive and starts committing his pawns, not that he can play e4 right now, but if he starts committing his pieces and pawns, um, that makes it difficult for him to be fluid later. So he plays g3, and this is incredibly flexible. And so one idea that occurred to me um, is I could play g6, and we could play this symmetrical fianchetto thing, and he'd probably play d4, and we get into Slav or Queen's Gambit decline territory or something like that. Um, and again, I'm just trying to get positions that he's probably not seen before. And I sit, and I sit, and I'm like, okay, sure, I'm the raiding favorite, in this game, but that doesn't mean that it's easy for me, especially because I have much to learn about openings. Um, eventually I settle on playing c6 and trying to transpose into some Slav-ish, uh, I don't know what, um, but that's my goal. Now he plays d4. This was a surprise to me. I expected that after playing g3, certainly he would follow with either knight f3 or bishop g2 and make these decisions about the pawn center later. There really isn't a need for him to play this right away. Um, unless he's super concerned that I might play e5 or something, but why would he be concerned about that? I don't know. Um, at any rate, because he plays d4, I play d5, and now the center is locked. Now this starts to get a little more rigid and calcified, and um, I'm able to have targets to attack and force him to commit his pieces to certain squares. He's going to have to deal with this tension that's already started. If he'd held back a bit, again with bishop g2 or knight f3, I would have had to do something committal first. And maybe I wouldn't have done very much. Maybe I would have just played like g6 or maybe d6 or maybe even d5. I was seriously considering d5, but I was afraid of doing something committal unless my opponent also makes a commitment. And so because he plays d4, I feel more comfortable playing d5. Um, okay, and then we trade off. It definitely occurred to me to try to either do knight takes or queen takes, but then then I recognize that I'm conceding center space, and I don't feel like conceding anything to this guy. At this point, we have reached equality. Yes, he's going to get to Fianchetto his bishop and target my d-pawn, but I think I'm doing okay here, and I'm just counting on um, that I'll be able to outmaneuver him later in the game. Because if I'd done, like, knight takes or queen takes, then then my pawn on c6 is not so good, and he gets a strong center, and it's just really not worth it. There's too much risk and not enough reward there. So I go for an equal position and just assume that I'm going to either outplay him or he's just going to continue playing well and there's nothing I can do. Um, an exchange slav is what we've ended up in. It wasn't exactly my goal, but my opening knowledge is kind of weak. Um, I did successfully take him out of his opening knowledge, which was my goal, but I should set higher goals for myself. I should set goals which involve knowing openings and, um, I don't know, um, out-knowledging my opponents. But anyhow, this is early in the morning. I can perhaps forgive this sort of thing. Um, so, 
Uh, we, if he manages to mount enough pressure on this D pawn, then I might be forced to play E6. But I'd much rather have my pawn on this other side of, the, um, of this pawn wall if I could. I'd rather have the bishop on f5 or g4. To that end, probably bishop g4 is most accurate, although it encourages f3. Um, I mean, yeah, I could just play knight c6 and wait for him to go attack my center pawn again, but I don't feel like doing that. I feel like being more provocative and trying to challenge my opponent and give him opportunities to make mistakes. And so I do play bishop f5, even though perhaps it's not... I don't know objectively where that stands. Um, it certainly weakens b7 a lot, and might give me double pawns in all kinds of various ways, and d5 is really hanging in the balance here. Um, so my opponent plays queen b3, very astutely targeting um, these obvious targets. And um, I avail myself of this opportunity to develop my knight. And just trust me, the tactics work out. This is the point where I start waking up and seeing, you know, actually it was a move ago when I played bishop f5, I saw queen b3, knight c6. Um, and just recognize that, okay, I'm taking some risks here. But this gets us out of this really stagnant position where um, he might be able to just hold a draw or even grind me down. I'm going for something much more aggressive, much more tactical and challenging and complex, even if it's not necessarily sound. Um, and to that end, I really spooked my opponent, and, um, so he didn't take. Instead, he played knight f3, and man, that caught me by surprise. Um, I'm not going to go into all the tactics. You guys can do that if you so choose, but yeah, as Stockfish evidence is in the, cor in the margin there, uh, I didn't blunder this at any point, um, at least not yet. So yeah, knight f3, sure, it's fine, but... Now black can equalize really easily. Even queen b6 is fine. Um, rook b8 might be okay. No, rook b8's not good. Uh, b6 might work. I'm not sure what other things might be okay here. Uh, black has all kinds of options that are fun. Um, I go for something a little bit adventurous, and in hindsight, I'm not such a fan. Um, I saw that my knight wasn't going to go to e5 anytime soon, and so I felt like attacking this queen, and again, just trying to really shake up my opponent, and um, try to get some initiative out of him misplaying something. Um, this is not a recommended approach. You're supposed to abide by opening principles, and this move really does not abide by opening principles. Um, maybe queen d7 is slightly better. Um, it's really sharp, I think. I, I don't want to get too caught up in the technical details here, but it's like, uh, this is kind of loose. He's attacking these. I'm more or less forced to take this because of queen c7, bishop f4. He takes back, and I guess now I have to play knight e4. And um, he's got a advanced e pawn. He could support this with f4. Um, this is still kind of awkward, and it's a game. It's definitely a game, but um, why go for this if you don't have to? And I'm sure there's all kinds of other tactics and lines to be considered here, but I, I went for knight a5. It's sufficiently complicated and interesting that even though it doesn't guarantee any advantage, it might shake up my opponent and again transform the position in ways that require my opponent to keep adjusting to what's going on. And I'm just trying to make things unclear 
so that um, fun tactics might result later. So, or yeah, I'm just trying to get tactical positions here. All right, so he checks me. It's a really natural move because it forces me to block one way or the other. Obviously, I can't block with the queen, which is defending the knight. Um, maybe I could have blocked with the knight. I don't know. This seems perfectly fine. I still haven't committed my bishop one way or the other, either in front of my pawns or behind it. Uh, my d5 pawn is still standing strong here, and that's kind of important. Like, my opponent had more pressure on d5. Say if this knight weren't on f3 and instead he had a knight on c3 and this were still back on g1, um, then d5 might be something to seriously be concerned about. But here I've defended it once and he's not even attacking it. So this allows my pieces pretty much free reign to go wherever they want. I think this was a game 60. Or maybe it was 60 plus 5 second delay, or maybe it was game 75, or something like that. I don't remember. Uh, it was a recent tournament. It was good fun. Um, so he plays queen d1. He goes all the way back, which actually I believe is his strongest option here. And now I sat and thought for quite a while. I know we're on move 9. Um... I'm making up theory as I'm going along, and while I am succeeding in forcing my opponent to think, and I am getting unique and novel positions that don't resemble things he already has memorized, and therefore he won't be able to draw this without some challenges, um, I really don't have very many winning chances here. His position is very solid. Uh, the only thing in my favor is that I have three pieces developed to his two, and um, it's my t turn, so... And you could argue my knight on a5 is not that well developed either. But I have some development lead, and I've got a little bit of initiative here. But, yeah, it's almost nothing to work with. He's playing some really solid moves, and it's difficult for me to assert any advantage against that. I prevent knight e5, or at least ensure that he's not going to get my bishop if that does happen. Um, maybe there's better moves to be played. There probably are, but let's not get caught up in the nuances of this opening. Um, I'll just chalk this opening up there, this knight c6, I'll chalk that up to it just being early in the morning and um, my not having the motivation to go try to look for what's the absolute strongest move in this position. It's probably um, bishop f5. Um, but it could very well be something else. It could maybe be knight e4. There's so many things that could potentially be the strongest move. It could be rook c8. Uh, could be queen b6. Queen b6 is not so bad. Um, so, just knight c6 seemed like a safe-ish move, although, I mean, now position's fully equal, and it's almost impossible for me to claim an advantage, and I just have to hope that my opponent does mess up at some point. Um, queen c8, my idea is I'm just going to play bishop h3 and trade the bishops and try to checkmate him. Or at least intimidate him in some way. If I can't outplay him on the board, maybe I can outplay him in his mind. Or maybe I can like somehow concern him about what's going on. Again, I I mean, yeah, there are better moves. I could probably play bishop f5 and then e6 and then maybe bishop to e7 and castle and... A lot of really slow positional grinding. Maybe I could eke out some small positional edge that might somehow transfer into some minute, subtle nuance in a middle game and an end game. But I'm going for something a lot sharper if I can. Um, it's very risky. Uh, not to be recommended. But I did it because this is a more fun event, and I wanted to see like how this would play out. Um, 
so yeah he just plays knight c3 which is very good he's continuing development uh in some ways he's threatening like bishop f4 knight b5 knight c7 and this is just really tough all right well i make good on my threat to try to trade bishops I should really be more worried about just finishing my development, castling, and all that, but um, I'm just trying to get some really imbalanced, wild position out of this. Something that maybe I have a chance to tactically outplay my opponent. This is not a good strategy. Um, it's very committal, and there's not much reward involved, and there is a lot of risk. So, um, the only thing in favor of this move is it makes the game fun, at least in terms of what I was doing that morning, but I don't even know that it's a fun move, because it's more fun to win, you know? Um, so yeah, I just really don't like this bishop h3 in hindsight. And then I trade off, because, um... I don't know. This is a pretty sad analysis. I should be going into that in more detail. I should be more critical of my moves. I can't even say anything in their favor. They're just that bad. Um, I mean, it's not enough to lose the game, but it's enough to crush a person's chest soul if they do too much of it. Uh, so, again, this is just more motivation for me to pick up some kind of system other than symmetrical English against the English. I used to play in high school the symmetrical English um, as black. And um, there's certainly enough to get some interesting games, but or at least enough to get into a middle game that's not lost. But I need to do some more opportunistic openings and study... Um, more interesting systems. Like if he plays that, maybe I do play e5 and do reverse Sicilian, or maybe, I don't know, um, maybe I play c6 straight away and we go into a Slav proper. There's a whole lot of options I have at my disposal. Maybe I just play g6 and um, modern it up. Well, it's not called a modern there. I forget what it's called. Um, but anyhow, yeah, we got a sharp position. I'm clearly lagging on development, probably losing my B pawn, um, but succeeding in avoiding a draw. Bishop takes f6. I cannot explain this for life of me. Well, no, at the time in the tournament, I th it occurred to me that he probably did this just so he could fracture my pawns. Um, but g takes f6 is a move borrowed from the Karo Khan opening. Now, obviously, white's pawn's still on e2, but the same idea applies, that this half-open g file is actually useful for attacking, and potentially this h-pawn could get thrown forward. I don't know. The h-pawn throwing doesn't happen much in the Karo, but um, these pawns do control center squares. That bishop was a bishop. And, okay, it's going to take me a long time to get this bishop out to a useful square. Uh, even going to d6, it's still, uh, it's on one diagonal, and it can't really shuffle around very easily. Um, but no, I've got a bishop. I've got a half-open file. I have good central control. And, okay, the position is kind of closed in the center at the moment, but it's not going to remain that way forever. And so there are dynamic chances I can take advantage of here. And this is kind of what I was hoping for. And so, like, it just befuddles me. Like, sure, okay, yeah, I guess if you're worried that I might play e6, and then if I you do bishop takes, I do queen takes, I could see that concern. And I guess taking the knight does force me to double my pawns, but... Um, here with my development so far behind, um, yeah, queen b3 as indicated by Stockfish is just 
obvious and strong. And my opponent was concerned about doubling my pawns, so he went for this. Uh, I guess he just either didn't see or misevaluated queen b3. But anyhow, now he plays queen b3. And in response, I do something to make the game sharp, make it very exciting. I castle. This defends b7, this defends d5, and finally, I am no longer worried about the possibility of a draw. That possibility just completely evaporates at this point. Um, there's not going to be a draw. Um, so yeah, he's probably expecting that I would have played e6 instead of e5. But no, this is very cool. It's trying to power my way through the center. Um, and this is uh, kind of a Karo move, although again, the Karo usually don't castle queenside. So we have just reached a wild position where I'm hoping to outplay my opponent. And this is the style I play in. It's not sound, but it's fun. And that's kind of what I was going for. I've successfully avoided just sterile play, um, and okay, I've played something probably dubious to get here, but let's consider that the game starts here and then try to continue playing it from here, and ignore the fact that I've made these silly mistakes earlier in the opening and got this really wacky position where, objectively speaking, I am in an incredible amount of trouble. Like, I don't know, White just has to find these ideas of rook c1, and um, I'm not sure exactly how, but White's attack is definitely faster than Black's attack. Sure, Black's attack is obvious. Um, that's definitely in Black's favor that he, it's pretty clear what to do. But I don't think it's Black's attack is anywhere near as successful as White's could be. I mean, Black's king is super, super ultra, du incredibly exposed. White's not so much. All right, so for whatever reason, White's trying to like resolve the tension and not worry about this d pawn being loose and not worry about me pushing e4 and trying to win d4 and. Um, I think he's just got a little materialistic. And, yeah, there's all kinds of variations as to how this could have gone instead of taking the pawn. But now note, I no longer have the double pawns. My pawns control the center. Yes, they are kind of hanging pawns, uh, even though there is an f-pawn that could support them. But um, this is just um, interesting. So... Yeah, in one move, we've gone from being inferior to being okay. And um, White's center of control and his options as to where he puts his pieces and how he restricts mine from moving anywhere are all just eroding step by step. Um, E3. Note that if my opponent played E4 instead, I could just take the knight king takes and then knight d4 taking the queen um, during the game i was under the illusion that prior to e3 i could have just taken the knight king takes and then knight d4 check um, and all, even after the game for days afterward i still thought that possibility was there now as i'm looking at it if i just had done queen takes f3 he would have done pawn takes queen and that would have been pretty foolish of me. So I actually didn't miss anything there, despite being really super, I don't know, not in it that day. Um, but E3 is another pawn move. It gives me time to move another piece. And, um, okay, well, okay, I do move a pawn, but the purpose of the pawn move is to help me get my pieces moving forward. So don't fault me for that one. It actually helps me continue my development. White plays e4, with the hope of kind of locking the center and making it difficult for me to move forward. 
I don't think that uh, E4 at all succeeds at that, at least if I played accurately. Um, I got kind of lost on some tactics here, uh, kind of freaked out and thought I had to play Queen H5 to try to win this. And I thought somehow with Queen H5 I was like winning this. But also I thought Queen H5 was necessary at this point because he's just, I mean, he's got this obvious idea of Knight F5 and F4 and probably has to move the king away so that the pawn can support the other pawn. But um, he's got this obvious thing and his knight controls all these useful squares and his other knight's moving out of the way and he's playing Rook C1 and it's pretty clear what white needs to do. Um, on black's side, it's not so clear what black should be planning. Certainly, queen e6 occurred to me, and I I just did not believe he would trade queens. That would not happen. The uh, reason that would not happen um, it would be that now his knight on h4 has nowhere to go. This is all covered. Um, so... Yeah, Stockfish recommends that knight d4, knight d5 would happen. I wasn't sure if it'd be. Oh, yeah, actually, knight d5 is kind of forced. I was gonna say maybe he moves the queen somewhere first. But no, knight d5 is the move. Um, uh, Z nation. It depends on the position. Maybe after I go through these three games, we'll look at it. Um, it really depends, though. I don't know what to tell you. So, um, yeah, I played queen e6 would have been most accurate because knight d5 and because all kinds of tactics ensure that I'm actually okay here and that white isn't getting a knight f5 for free. Um, how does this even work? So king b8, getting the king out of dodge, trying to exchange down on d5. Why doesn't white just play knight f5? During the game, I thought this was possible. I thought this would be good for white. Maybe I just do knight e7 anyway. And force some trades. Maybe that's why knight f5 isn't so strong. Or maybe there's some interesting pin going on here. Maybe the knight on f5 isn't as good as it looks. That would be wild. Like, certainly I could consider a5 and trying to drop the bishop here and just see what happens, but... Um, actually, to prevent queen b5, this would prevent it. <laughs> Due to the pin that's on this diagonal. Um, that's incredible, if that works. Like, this sort of thing kind of sort of occurred to me during the game, but I didn't expend the time and energy and effort to analyze it, because I just didn't believe in it. Um, but no, maybe this is why uh, Stockfish doesn't recommend um, moving knight f5 right away, and recommends moving the queen to b5 first and allowing white to continue rolling these forward and threatening stuff and kind of forcing black to play knight e7 and uh, deal with the fact that black is cramped uh, and black has no chance of like after these pieces trade this bishop cannot attack the knight once the knight's on the light squares this is just super uncomfortable for black. It shows that black's uh, opening play was highly risky. And then with strong, accurate play, white could probably, I don't know, force black to defend for the remainder of the entire game. Um, so that was one way it could have gone. Um, and so... Wait. Wait, so how's this go again? So Stockfish recommends after knight e7, we trade off here. I mean, something like this occurred to me during the game in my head. Um, Stockfish is far more optimistic about this position than I am. 
Like, if I look at this, I see that black has got no winning chances. But Stockfish thinks that black, because he has the bishop, is somewhat better. Um, I do not believe that at all. Not one bit. This is just very difficult for black to maneuver. The only thing in black's favor is this advanced pawn. And with so many pieces on the board, it's going to be one hell of a fight before that extra pawn ever amounts to anything. And black still has development troubles, so I mean, what do you do? We're trying to kick the queen away so we can move the bishop to c5, and the queen's not obliging. Uh, so we allow, we allow an exchange, and white doesn't take it. Um... I do not understand. Okay, you know, I understand. Um, never mind on that. Yeah, if white trades on e7, then that extra pawn starts to count more and more. It's not even an extra pawn, but it's just a passed pawn. The more that gets traded, the better that passed pawn is. So white wants to hold on to the knight um, and try to mate black on the queen side. Black wants to trade off all the pieces and try to make something of this advanced pawn somehow. And a bishop versus knight endgame results, and these are on dark squares, and black has minuscule chances of winning that sort of stuff. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, this is this is a very dynamic position. Sure, I guess if if we believe in my kingside attack, and I don't, I really don't, but if we believe in that, then yeah, black could be better here. This knight is expertly placed to stop the attack. And if I push the h-pawn, he could even consider h4, or even allow the pawn all the way up to h3, and still it's not clear that black's gotten anything. Meanwhile, white's attack, I mean, is equally challenged. Um, black has somewhat better control of the queen side squares, um, but white's plans to roll the queen side are a little more obvious, and more likely to force black to concede just a little space. Um, I don't think it's enough for white to actually break through on the queen side and win everything, but I think he can force a lot of pieces to get traded and put black in an uncomfortable endgame. Um, well, white doesn't want to trade pieces, though, because the more that get traded, the stronger the d-pawn is, but yeah, there's a lot going on. It's a very dynamic, unclear position. Stockfish prefers black. I actually prefer white, even though this knight doesn't do well to attack. It's expertly placed to defend things. It's incredibly difficult for black to attack on the king side. Black is going to need to find a way to liquidate things on the queen side without getting mated, and that's not easy. Um, although I guess it's not very easy to see how white progresses either. I just somehow assume that that's going to work out. And maybe I'm too optimistic, but anyway, we didn't go there. Um, so because I was afraid that one, that would kill all my, or queen e6 would kill my chances of winning the game, and two, queen e6 looked like white was even better there to me, even though Stockfish prefers black, I went for this hyper-aggressive, crazy queen h5 move. Um... My key idea is that once this knight moves, I can play my queen over to e2, and my development sucks, but maybe I can um, trigger some kinds of tricks with like b2 and e4, and maybe get my rooks out, and I don't know, play h4 or f5, or do something tricky. That was my plan. Do something that like my opponent wouldn't expect. Um, so let's see how this plays out. He plays knight d5, because again, he's kind of forced to move that knight. Uh, this actually plays well with his idea of just moving his rook over, maybe even sacking it on c6, maybe playing his pawn to a6. 
there's a really good chance I'm getting mated if I don't play well here. Um, <laughs> apparently bishop c5 just loses, um, courting stockfish. Uh, what was I looking at during the game? I'm trying to remember. Like, rook g8 occurred to me. Although rook g8, knight f6, and he's winning in exchange. Um, queen e2 is a possibility. Uh, this is very tactically sharp. Um, oh, I was looking at a5 also. But, I mean, you could spend forever looking at these things. And that's kind of the point of the post-mortem, is you're supposed to look at all the details and see where it is that you messed up. In my case, I'm blaming it on um, uh, just one, my lack of opening knowledge, and two, my overcommitment to trying to push my opponent and force him to think at the expense of completely ruining my position. Um, oh yeah, King B8 did occur to me during the game. I didn't see the point, but Stockfish says there's some point to it probably ensures that rook c1 doesn't kill me as badly as it does. Like, if I can rush my king over to, to a8, I might be okay. Um, who knows? Anyway, I played bishop c5. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I saw this during the game. Um, and that's what actually got played. And I played b6, and after this, I recognized that my position was just completely falling apart at the seams. The, like, I know I keep saying that, but it's so true. Like, this is so incredibly not responsible play on Black's part. Uh, my queen side is very quickly coming apart. It's amazing. Uh, even his a5 move does well to smash this open. And it's going to take some tactical magic to hold this together um so yeah so we'll see how this went okay uh, i'm 500 rating points the favorite not exactly 500 but I'm, I'm pretty big favorite this game and definitely feeling the heat and this is just round one of the event and i'm thinking oh my goodness what have i gotten myself into by playing this um, and where am I going to go with this? Um, so apparently most accurate was, yeah, I was expecting queen b5, threatening like queen a6 and b4, and I'm just like completely dead. There's like nothing black can do. Black's attack is ridiculously slow, and queen b5 covers the e2 square. So, yeah. I mean, it's just embarrassing, really. Uh, but no, he plays a5, which is good enough. And what do I come up with here? Oh yeah, I just finally deliver on my threat. Threatening to threaten to maybe threaten something. Um, if I'm lucky. And... Um, okay, so... This is an interesting thing that Stockfish spots. Um, wow, that's strong. I didn't see that. Even when I went over the game afterward, I didn't see that. Um, but if we ignore this amazing tactical shot, like what I did see was pawn takes. And I'm still just dead. Super ultra mega dead. Um, like, it, it's not even worth commentating on how dead it is. There's... Every variation works for white. He's, like, either promoting or getting my king or... Um, it's just embarrassing. Um, and all my pieces are pinned, and my only useful attacking piece is my queen. And the only piece supporting it's the bishop, which is pinned, and he could sack the exchange if he wants to, and... I mean, this is... you don't want to have this position. Um, so for sure, I took 
lots and lots of risks and I avoided a draw at all costs and this is what happens um, but it gets better so um, yeah. he plays rook c2 Stockfish apparently doesn't like this move it evaluates that this is a swing from plus four to minus four um, it doesn't quite work out oh yeah, I know this rook c2, I immediately pounce on the e-pawn, and I'm like, what was my opponent thinking? Did they completely miss this, or what? And yeah, now I'm up the knight. Um, and the rest is technique. I mean, we could look at it, but um, I think there's only one interesting point in the remainder of this game. Um, no, either white just overestimated his attacking chances or didn't see that he was hanging the knight and that my queen just holds everything together. Um, it's kind of amazing how that all turned around. And yeah, no, I don't think there's anything really worth analyzing here at this point. Um, I was just stunned. Like this rook c2, I didn't get it at all. Like even rook takes c5, I might have understood. There's some purpose and point, and even if I take on e4, um, things are unclear. Uh, obviously, knight takes b6 as strongest, as pointed out by Stockfish. I didn't see that. I don't think he would have ever seen that, or I ever would have. Um, or would have taken who knows how many, uh, many, many minutes to find that move. Um... I wasn't really trying to prey on my opponent here. I was just trying to get a really imbalanced position and something where maybe I could out-calculate him. Um, I'm not attempting to set traps. I'm just attempting to, um, to play lines where I legitimately get some kind of initiative. But no, he completely seized the initiative this game, completely had me and then um, just didn't see what was going on. Or either maybe even missed that just queen takes pawn is check. I don't know. It's very confusing to me what happened. Maybe what he intended, and I can't speak for him, but maybe this, protecting the knight. But this doesn't work. I mean, I could just take the knight, I could take the rook, I, I'm i just stunned. Um, so that's how round one went. Um, yeah, there's not really much more to look at there. It was a very sharp game. Um, so with that, uh, it was quite the interesting introduction to the tournament. Got my queen all the way over to h5 and then to e2 pretty much violated every opening principle in the book and I was thinking gosh what am I doing here today I almost lost to somebody that um, against which rating wise I was a fa heavy favorite ratings aren't everything but they are something and so um, yeah if my opponent can overlook a check that like wins the game on the spot um, it's just a two-move combination, and aside from that one tactic, he's crushing me. Maybe, maybe this was not the best day for me to play in an event. That's kind of what was going through my head, but at the same time, I'm just like, you know what? Don't worry about it. Just hang around, see like if I recognize friends, whatever, that are going to this event. Try to socialize. Some chess players are actually social folk and just try to enjoy it. Don't stress out about ratings, because, I mean, that sort of stuff is pretty stressful anyhow. And just try to have some fun, and hope that future games will be better. With that, um, I observed that after my game, and after our adjacent board's game, Actually, they had finished theirs first. 
Um, I think I saw the number two seed was giving his opponent some good opening advice and appeared to really understand some specific lines of uh, sub variations of the Sicilian or something. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. How am I the number one seed when that guy knows all the openings and I don't know much? Um, and turns out, so met a couple friends at the tournament who I uh, haven't seen in a while. It was uh, good to see them again. Uh, socialized between the rounds and um, tried to get an appreciation for how their people's games are going. And I think. Yeah, we had our lunch break. Um, I brought leftovers with me to the tournament site, and that was pretty good. Could also get pizza, soda, and all that there. Um, people were like looking at databases and games and puzzles, and um, it was all a lot of fun. And then round two started, and I got white. And I got paired with the number two seed, and I'm like, uh, okay. Did not expect that. This is an eight-player section. I sure, yeah, we both won the first round game, and okay, I think there were three decisive games and a draw in that section. And somehow the pairings work out that I get paired with the number two guy. Um ordinarily you would expect that number one and number two seed would get paired in the final round if at all but okay yeah we'll roll with this i'm gonna get paired with this guy sooner or later i figure so we'll there's no need to complain about it to the td and it's for fun anyway um but man that really confused me um but it also worked to my advantage because i got the white pieces and i think it was somehow to balance the colors of the players uh or the of the pieces that the players get i think both um my opponent and i had had the black pieces in round one and to ensure that we're both going to get the same number of whites and blacks in this event um it's better to pair us sooner rather than later i assume that's what happened and that's why we got paired or maybe I'm just making that up, but I, I assume that somehow colors were related to um, this pairing choice, which seemed really weird to me. Um, so, we're going to take a look at this. Um, oh, I played the English. Yeah, that's right. Um, it used to be that I would play the English almost every over-the-board game. Um, just to try to get positions that aren't highly deeply booked up. Um, English allows you to do more flexible things with the position without worrying about very specific tactics and very specific positions. Um, my opponent plays knight f6, and I'm like, okay. I've wimped out before. In previous games, I've played things like g3 and knight f3 and knight c3 and maybe even e3. I don't remember. Um, but today, I take the challenge head on. I play d4. And I figure we're going to go uh, queen pawn this or bust. And sure, in games past, I've avoided d4. And we'll see in a minute the reason why. c5. Okay, this encourages me to run forward, and I do. And this is the reason that I typically avoid playing d4 on move 2. We've got ourselves a Banco. <laughs> and I don't play the Banco. I mean, yeah, I've read about maybe a dozen games or so where people have played the Banco with all kinds of various ideas but I just don't remember this. I haven't committed it very well. Um, and I don't have an appreciation for what white's supposed to do to defeat it other than trying to break in the center or target some backward pawn around here. Or if black gets really careless, go for a mate on the king's side. 
Um, but I figured, you know what, after that round one game, you know, I'm not going to be backing down from challenges anymore. I'm going to face these challenges head on. We're going to go, um, going to yo-yolo this, as it were. Um, yeah, I really have to, uh, yeah. I mean, this is a super ultra-critical opening. Uh, you really have to know what you're doing to play it. And I figure, you know what? I came here to play chess. I'm not going to avoid the main line anymore. And if my opponent just completely beats me down for it, okay. At least that'll give me something to look at after the game and figure out what I did right and what I did wrong. And if he completely wipes the floor with me, I'll have all the motivation in the world to go back in the game and actually look at and study it. So that's what was going through my mind, is that I'm not going to run from this anymore. I'm going to take it on head first and see how I do. Can't be afraid of this thing forever, and I do need to learn to play well against it. Um, so I was considering this to be more of a training game than anything at this point, and expected had every expectation of either losing this or struggling to get some perpetual check at the end. Um, that's really how I thought this would go at this point, because I don't know the Banco. But I'm not going to run from it. We're going to go for it. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I've read tons and tons of things about the Banco. I just don't remember any of it. Unless I play it, I'm going to completely forget it. Um, but thanks for the offer, but it's not going to work. So, yeah, I play out these book moves. I don't remember if knight c3's book or not. Maybe it isn't. I have no idea. Uh, uh, this is so deeply theoretical. Um, yeah, I think the, the more standard way to play this is just to play g3 right away and then knight c3 and then e4 and then transpose into what we saw in the game i think knight c3 is a little bit committal because there are other places this might my knight may would want to go for example you might want to go to d2 to c4 or a3 to c4 on c3 the knight's not super effective um so yeah, that's more committal than it needs to be, and g3 is probably more accurate. Oh, uh, knight c3 is book. Okay. b6 is a sideline. Um, oh yeah, no, no, pawn to b6 is, I mean, it's a sideline. I'm not avoiding, I'm not going to play sidelines like that. I'm going to go big or go home here, because if I don't do that, I'll never know how to play this. So, okay, apparently knight c3 is the correct move order. Stockfish actually likes this and gives it a plus 0.6. Not that that means anything, but just means that I haven't completely messed this up yet. Um, and yes, yeah, so I just play... I got this. This kind of, if I remember right, is how I'm supposed to do it. It's like play e4, we trade on f1, and then I play king g2. And try to play like f4 after this, maybe... I don't know. Um, so I'm pretty sure that this is close-ish to what white's supposed to do. Um, I don't want to waste everybody's time looking at databases. And I know I asked my friends after the game, um, like, is this in general what I'm supposed to be doing? And got some pretty affirmative answers back but I'm still not convinced. Um, yeah, obviously black gets a lot of pressure for that pawn, and this is not an easy position for white to play. And um, I play what happens to be one of the sharpest lines in it, apparently. Um, and you guys can probably criticize me for how I played it. Um, so you guys are saying, Knight of three normally comes to d2 and then to c4 um, and the knight does belong on c3 okay well, that's good to know um, 
So I play queen c2. I thought I remember during the game that queen e2 was more typical, but... Um, so for so many reasons during the game, this move seemed to make a lot of sense. Like, it protects e4. It, I mean, e2 or c2 are both going to protect e4. Um, this gives me options of like pushing b3 and knight a4 and doing some really interesting things. Um, but, I mean, maybe it's a luxury I shouldn't be able to afford. Maybe it's okay-ish, but might not be the most accurate way to play this. Um, certainly on e2 it's a lot more threatening, or the idea of playing e5 is a lot more imminent. Um, given that queen takes e5 could follow, or the queen supports a capture of the knight um, on e5. And I know that white's supposed to be playing to push e5, but I'm kind of a coward here because I don't know the moves. And, be well, I mean, my king could get very exposed very quickly. I try to play something more conservative and not... Um, throw in everything after e5 all at once here. Um, okay, so apparently rook b1 is another thing that could be done. I guess that makes some sense because it sidesteps um, a, a potential discovery on the long diagonal. It does help protect the b2 pawn and give the bishop some freedom of mobility. Um, and I guess white and black are both dancing around here trying to decide who's going to commit to some kind of pawn formation first. I mean, yeah, obviously the d-pawns here are locked and the c5 pawn and the e7 pawn and all this aren't going very far. But white hasn't finalized these pawns on the queen side and black hasn't finalized. Is he going to push e6? Is he going to push I don't know what? probably not going to push any of that. He's just going to throw all his pieces toward the queen side and see what happens. But, um, yeah, at any rate, that's what he chooses to do is just knight a6. It's just a good sane developing move. Don't really have anything negative to say against that. Um, again, I thought that this d6 pawn would be a huge target, and I do want to play e5. After the game, I think one of my friends recommended that I should be playing for like f4 and e5, but I don't believe that. Um, I didn't believe at all in this idea of h4, h5. That seems ridiculous. I just want to develop my bishop. But as you guys are pointing out, why don't I just play like rook b1, right? Well, here there's a specific tactic to worry about, and that's rook b1, knight b4, and my queen and pawn are attacked. So... Unfortunately, here rook b1 doesn't quite work out. Also, queen b3 is kind of silly after rook fb8. So, um, yeah, I just decided to continue developing and as assume the best. Uh, prepare for the worst, but just assume things are going to go swimmingly here. Um, yeah, and... I guess one thing I could have considered was like try to land a knight on c4, but I don't think tactically it would have worked out. Um, so here he plays rook fb8, and um, oops, let's turn off these stockfish arrows for a second. Yeah, I don't want either of those. That's just distracting. Um, So yeah, computer recommends that I just play rook hb1 here. Um, again, yeah, I can't play rook ab1 because of knight b4 and, you know, tactics. Rook hb1 definitely did come to mind. Um, I just thought that knight a4 was an improvement, and then I could follow with rook hb1 later. Um, but that queen on b6 is not so well placed for black. And so yeah, rook hb1 is probably better played now, and knight a4 is just ridiculous. Um, what I was counting on is being able to play knight a4, knight d2, knight c4, b3, and then move the rook away, I don't know, to e1 or something. This takes five moves. Um, 
one of which will be attacking the queen, one of which will be because it's my move to start with, the other three of which are complete and total pipe dream that have nothing to do with the position on the board. Um, so yeah, I just need to be way more patient about this. And um, Stockfish is recommending rook hb1, knight b4, queen d2. And it's just going to be uh, an incredible maneuvering game ahead. Um, anything can happen. It's possible that also we've diverged from theory earlier in this opening. Uh, again, anything might happen. Um, theory's sharp, but at least I'm not hanging anything, and somehow miraculously my knight protects both of these pawns. My queen defends b2, and I don't know, by some miracle everything's just barely okay here. Uh, I guess queen a6 threatens like queen d3 or knight a2, and um, what do I do? Oh, I don't have to defend b2 as strongly. I stop the d3 invasion. c4 renews an idea of, or introduces this idea. Maybe this other knight wants to go somewhere too, and this is super uncomfortable for white. Oh! Oh, that's cool. So I could just flat out stop this invasion. Oh. I've never seen knight e1 played in this system, but usually that's because the rook is on e1. Wow. Okay. That's pretty cool. Let me back up. Um, so let's go back. You guys are saying that what if we play rook b1, knight b4, queen b3, um, rook fb8 a3. Well, I'm not sure that I follow. Maybe you're saying I misspoke somewhere here. Um, rook fb8 a3. Oh, you're saying that white plays a3. Not that that's one super complicated rook move that just jumps across the board. You're saying that, um, uh, assuming that it's white's move here, white just plays a3. I'm probably missing something, because it's black's move here. Oh, yeah, yeah, rook b1, I guess, is theoretical. I didn't know. And you guys were likely indicating earlier here, like way back, um, instead of this queen c2, I just play rook b1 here also. And unlink, unlike most Englishes, where in an English, black would just play bishop f5 and the rook would have to move. Well, there's no bishop, and there's nothing to force the rook to move, so the rook would make sense on b1. It's still really sharp. Um, but having that on b1 would free up my other pieces to move elsewhere. Um, yeah. Anyhow... Um, on account of this knight e1, I've apparently stopped black from invading, but it looks incredibly scary because, I mean, he could still do this, right? This is what's recommended when it means but knight d7, I suppose. Oh, yeah, or it could go through e5 instead. Um, okay, so yeah, it looks like knight d3 is happening. One of these knights is going to d3. This needs to play, I need to play rook to b1 again, and queen d2, and I've kind of made a fortress, I'm still ahead the pawn, um, but this is about as uncomfortable as this position can possibly get for white. White's successfully held on to the pawn at the expense of having no winning chances. <laughs> I mean... So the evaluation prior to this knight a4 was plus 0.2, meaning white's up a pawn, but you know, you probably don't want to have that pawn. I mean, you're probably just a little bit greedy holding on to that pawn. You might regret it. 
especially against a human, because it's just difficult for a human to play this kind of position. Maybe a computer could grind it out, but humans, not so much. Yeah, so I played knight a4, and he responds queen b5, and here I'm kind of screwed. Um, so all my stuff's loose, it's like got knight b4, um, if my queen goes bad places, like after knight b4, he might be able to do queen e2, and it's just terrifying, really. Um, so what do I do? I double down. I play b3. Um, uh, yeah, of course I considered a3. Of course I considered that, but I, I mean, I've seen a couple Benko games, maybe once or twice sometime in the last decade or so, and I kind of think you're not supposed to play a3 because that makes it really difficult. Plus, I have no chance of, like, fortifying everything with knight c4 and b3. This is really not the pawn formation I was aiming for, and this is just super uncomfortable for white. And maybe I should start playing the Benko as black. It could be fun. Certainly fun things could happen if I played the Benko. Um, yeah, the trick is for white to give up the pawn when black has to make some positional concession to get the pawn. Yeah, you see, like, when I played this bishop f4, I was thinking, you know, he's just going to give me a tempo eventually, and I'm just going to push e5, and everything's going to work out magically, and I'm going to get enough pressure, and either I'll get a past d pawn somehow, or I'll make some target out of the e pawn, or some magic's going to happen here, and I'll be fine. My opponent played far more aggressively than I expected, and I just, yeah. I played very sharply, um, far more than my position is able to support, um, and this is what results. So he plays knight b4, it's an excellent find. Again, his knight on f6 is attacking e4, his knight on b4 is attacking my queen. Uh, his queen controls e2, so I either have to play queen c4, queen takes queen, pawn takes queen, rook takes knight, losing my knight, or I've got to play queen b1 to hold on to my e-pawn. Any other move, and I just give up the e-pawn for nothing. Alright, so queen b1's forced. Um, and my opponent plays knight f takes d5. Um, I don't claim to understand any of what's going on here. I expected that that knight on f6... Pardon me, I expected that knight on f6 would probably go to d7 or h5, or um, the white or black would have some way of ganging up on this pawn in the center. Um, queen d3 did come to mind. Uh, Stockfish is recommending knight d3, which really threatens to shatter this, as well as just take the e-pawn for free, as well as discover along the long diagonal here. And, I mean, yeah, by doing all the shuffling on the queen side, I've just made my position worse. Um, knight c3 is possible to try to complicate this, and he takes there. I double my pawns, which is okay, except for one little detail. That detail being that just my center is falling apart. Um, my center is very much not in a good state. And okay, so I have to guard my knight. And yeah, f4 is loose, and knight on c3 is loose, and I have to do that. And why doesn't he just take the rook? I mean, maybe he does. Maybe he just takes the rook. Anyway, black is just far better here. And White spent too much time shuffling around and not enough time making progress. Um, so, yeah, just the combination of all of White's ideas have been scattered all across the board. With White playing e4 and king g2 and bishop f4 and knight a4, White doesn't really have a coherent plan and black is capable of exploiting that 
However, he sees this funny little move. Knight takes d5. Okay. And down the rabbit hole we go. Um, pawn move, white plays. Usually is b3 when playing theory. Um, but I suppose that white probably doesn't hang material in doing so. Um, right, you know, I've seen at least one position where that discovery on the diagonal is just not worth it. Um, okay, but here we go. I didn't actually expect him to take the rook right away. I mean, that rook's going to be there forever and ever. Because I don't have a bishop that I can stick on b1 to guard a2. So I'm kind of forced to leave the rook there, but he takes it immediately. Okay, that's fine, whatever. Um, I don't know that I agree with c4, but I didn't expect him to take it, is my point. And I thought, maybe I'm okay here. Um, actually, yeah, he's traded off two minor pieces to get a rook and a pawn, which is more than a bit silly. It's traded off his most active pieces. Now my knight on a4 actually is kind of reasonable. One thing that's awful about this position is that his pieces can kind of tear through center at this point. Or at least he's able to bring his queen to d3 or e2 and bring his knight over to d3. He's threatening to take d5 and maybe he's able to shuffle his pieces. I don't know, get his rook to e8 and then the open e file. This is not anywhere near as easy as it would have been if he didn't go for that silly two pieces for the rook thing and pawn, but um, I guess he was just feeling really optimistic. Um, this is super uncomfortable, but uh, he took on d5 and that enabled me or forced me to play bishop h6. And I was concerned that I really liked Black's position here. It's uncomfortable, but I think that Black is marginally better here. Or at least that it, I don't expect White to formulate any winning chances, and that maybe Black can formulate some. Um, at least with accurate play, I didn't expect much to happen. Like I did, I completely, entirely expected f6 to be played here. And yeah, uh, I was thinking like along the lines of like rook d1 or rook e1 or something to develop this rook. Um, it's, or maybe just rook or pawn h4, h5. Um, Stockfish likes queen d1 or e1. Um, oh yeah, this this threat did occur to me as well. That's, uh, I saw that too. I don't know that I would have found queen d2, but I wasn't sure, like, what was going on here. Um, these ideas occurred to me, but not this particular variation. Uh, the idea that, like, black's pawns could form this kind of shape and that his d-pawn would be weakened, and maybe I'd have to double up along this way, and maybe his rooks and queen could somehow hold this. Apparently they can't. Apparently I do get the pawn back right away. So this is okay for white, but if not for that, white would be in deep doo-doo. Um, so it's quite fortunate that white has that resource, this queeny one which, um, on account of this, uh, forces either... Well, what's wrong with king f7? How come this doesn't hold things together? What's the deal here? I'm not seeing it. There's got to be something here. I'm just not seeing it. Uh, somehow this must be okay. Uh, 
so I'm not seeing it. I'm just going to turn on the computer just for expediency's sake. <laughs> I've turned off arrows, so it's not pointing me. Okay, what's your queen e4? Okay, I see that. Why would you play that? Why not queen c6? Okay, yeah, now you see queen c6. Bishop d2. Knight c3. Rook d1. All these things that keeps alternating between. Ultimately, I prefer rook d1, the best of all of those. Um, what's so wrong with knight b4 here? How is black not just much better after knight b4? Queen c4. Oh, okay, okay. So this white's able to force a pawn weakness. But with lots of really sharp moves, um, white can compel black. Um, black's forced to play e6. Or forced to push some of his pawns onto light squares and weaken his other pawns. And it's a difficult maneuvering game ahead for both players. Um, but it's a game. If he were able to keep his pawn just back on e7 and um, could somehow cover all his light squares in time, then that'd be a different story. But he's one tempo too slow from doing that. And therefore, this line um, is okay for white. Just by a thread. That's amazing. Um, See, so yeah, I was expecting f6, and I was super um, pessimistic about this position, but Stockfish advises that because of various amazing tactical resources, white's okay and not getting blown off the board. Which is quite fortunate, but I didn't see that during the game, I assure you. Um, but maybe my opponent also missed that and saw these these ideas like queen e5 and queen e4 and rook d1 and all that i don't know uh in any event he did play e5 which on its face seems to address all the issues um just one problem with it i take and yeah this goes from black being okay perhaps black being better or winning if white doesn't play accurately to Oh my god, what's happening? How is black surviving this? Uh, so in one move, the evaluation of this position pretty sharply changes. Um, I'm overstating things a little, just for dramatic effect, but the mental adjustment that black has to make here is very difficult to make. Um, and I think my opponent spent like five maybe ten minutes on this move uh i don't know that that was enough time i think it was more like five minutes i would have spent maybe 15 just because some radical change has happened to the position it's time to replan everything and make sure you're not missing anything because there's a very strong tendency for players to make two blunders in a row um okay and arguably pawn takes knight isn't a blunder um but yeah for sure f6 is more accurate i mean there's yeah um really you don't have to worry about trying to gain the pawn back or something to that effect uh it occurred to me that maybe queen c queen b7 might have been better threatening some stuff along this diagonal at this point black's threatening knight f4 and mating or winning the rook and stuff to which white just has to go back and you have an exciting game ahead um, but white's collected a second pawn for the exchange and black has hanging pawns here white in terms of material count things are even in terms of number of pieces that aren't pawns white has two knights and a bishop and a rook uh, compared to a knight and two rooks so in terms of just end games, it's better to have a greater n number 
or count of pieces. And the actual material value isn't as important in endgames as how many pieces you have, um, to some extent anyway. So that's what's going on there. Um, but yeah, my opponent did take d takes e5. I was just floored that this happened, and I'm like, okay. Um, after a few minutes, I did take back on e5. I couldn't figure out, like, what my opponent was up to here. Uh, I'm threatening mate on the move. So his moves are kind of forced at this point. Um, what was I expecting? Was I expecting f6? No, no, no. I saw that f6 is not so good. Um, well, for one thing, it just drops the knight with check. So never mind. I was looking at some other variation earlier. Uh, I don't remember it right now, so we'll not go into it. But um, yeah, these lines are complicated. In any event, he plays knight f4. Uh, apparently, queen takes f4 was perfectly good. I played g takes f4 because I thought I saw some winning combination. I imagined something that wasn't there. Yeah, queen c6 is a good find. Oh, this is what I was looking at earlier, is that um, if he plays f6, um, it's actually most accurate for me to not just take the pawn, but I have this check and... Um, Oh, shoot, he's still got queen b7. I must be thinking of something else, but there's some line where my queen going to the 7th rank is more effective than taking a pawn. Um, I don't remember where. But anyhow, he gives this check. I block it. Um, after much deliberation, I did even consider, like, what happens if I just go ahead and sack the rook? Do I have a way to mate here? Um... And I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and so there's this, and um, queen here, and rook b7 doesn't quite work out for me. Um, actually, I didn't even see that, like, what I was looking at during the game was a lot sharper. Retakes here, and then I got this check, and he's got to go into the corner, and then I got this. And here I'm looking at this checkmate a couple different ways. And I looked at queen g1 and just couldn't find a way for white to win this. Um, so I spent a while trying to calculate through those lines. And even assuming that this is accurate play for black to get to this point, um, white just can't win this. It's a draw. Despite having two different checkmate threats, and if rook g8, queen takes f6 being a third checkmate threat, um, yeah, white just can't win this. That's a pity, and I really wanted that to work out. Um, but no, I've just played f3 here, and I figured this best secures my king, and um, I'm not doing too badly here. Um, Stockfish prefers me here. I favored myself by maybe a point or so, This because um, my king's not safe. And black's king looks unsafe, but is it really? I don't know. Time will tell. Uh, I took on c5. Sockfish prefers the bloodthirsty queen e7. I don't know. I don't know, man. You're not going to find any chess player who plays these moves. Yeah, c4... I mean, okay, this did occur to me during the game, and my analysis stopped after rook c1, and I'm like, oh my god, if I get this position, it's going to take such technique to win this, and I just don't have that technique right now ready. And it would just take me a lot of time and effort and energy to figure out how to do this, and I'm not even sure that it works. And it's not worth expending all my time and energy and effort trying to figure out this one sub-variation. Um, when I can avoid this up front, but okay. I guess Stockfish says that this is a 
Uh, yeah, I mean, A2's loose if the queen gets traded. But apparently white's play counterbalances that um, material loss. Which it should, it's just that this is really hard to calculate. So I just took on c5, and I figure, you know what? Um, I'm up material, I have decent winning chances here. I could probably uh, find a way to maximize the activity of my pieces and make some kind of threat, and maybe I can win this. Yeah, rook b5 is bad. Um, yeah, as Stockfish points out, and I saw this during the game, black really has to go for it. None of this um, really weak... Uh, I don't have a polite word for it, so I'm not going to say a rude word for it, but... Black really needed to step up his game here. Because, um, yeah, rook b5 is easily countered by rook c1. And now this rook is dominated by the combination of rook, knight, and pawn. And the knight can swing over and attack the king, and the rook can quickly join it in an instant. Um, and black can't mount any attack with just a single rook. So this is just really tough now. Um... Okay, and I spent some time dawdling because I couldn't figure out what to do, and that's okay. I can forgive myself once in a while for playing not accurate moves. And yeah, I play h3 so that, you know, if case, in case my king ever gets attacked or has to go anywhere, I'm not going to drop the h pawn to this rook on b2. Um, and yeah, black does see to mobilize his rook, and good, it's good for him. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, this is what I first seen a couple of turns ago, and finally comes to fruition, is that, okay, you can take the pawn, um, just be forewarned, there's some magic here, because now I have this check, and if you go back to protect the pawn, I uh, check your king and it gets stuck in the corner, and that's bad. If you go um, forward here, this is quite nasty. Um, and then we're going to have, uh, well, I mean, it's one thing I'm threatening the knight fork, but it's another thing that I can also just pick off the f-pawn. So I have an abundance of choices or options here. Um, I'm not sure which is best. Uh, I didn't have enough time on my clock to go into all the details, but I'm feeling optimistic about white's position here. This pawn's not going anywhere, and white's king is safe, and it's very difficult for black to conjure up uh, meaningful threats. Okay, sure, it's super difficult for this knight to, like, teleport its way over to f8. Um, I mean, that might be very challenging for white to accomplish. Um... But I think ultimately white's going to be able to force black to play f5, and then the knight can somehow find its way to g5 and take the pawn. It's going to be one hell of a battle if I do that, and it's probably better that I try to hold on to the knight. Um, it's probably far better that I just like check him here and then take the f-pawn, or maybe just take the h-pawn outright. Um, but all this says that if he takes my b-pawn, I just check him, he kind of has to go this way. I didn't really look too deeply at this during the game, but I guess if I take here, and he goes there, and... Yeah, okay, this has got to be completely winning for white. So he doesn't have time, like when my knight moves away, he doesn't have time to take my pawn. That's basically what that all amounts to. Um... Alright, and Stockfish is saying that f5 was most accurate for black. Forcing this knight off of the e4 square. I guess I was thinking knight g5 here. I was really looking forward to just plunking the knight there. And then picking these pawns off one by one. And hopefully not getting perpetual while doing so. Um, well, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. Um, so apparently Stockfish prefers throwing this in first and then that check and then, okay, another check to force the king as far away as possible. 
Uh, why would you do that instead of Rook B8? I don't know. But anyhow, um, yeah, this is just way better for White. Because then I pick up the G pawn, and even if getting the F pawn's a hell of a fight, and I don't expect it to be, White should win this. White has more minor pieces. White's not afraid to trade a knight for a rook or a bishop for a rook. And black's king is kind of exposed, and so unless black can really strike quickly at this, and I don't think he can because white's knight really defends these adequately, and um, it's just going to be pain and suffering for black. So, that all said, um, we didn't go into that line. I was feeling optimistic about knight g5 first, but okay, rook c7 is a small improvement, and then knight g5 and just win all the pawns, and white wins that. It's definitely winning. Uh, rook b6 is played to hold on to this pawn, and now fun stuff happens. So we get this check, right? Um, and threatening to take the h pawn. My opponent's vaguely threatening to, like, trap some of my pieces or make it really difficult for them to move about. Um, but he's got to decide where to put his king. If he puts it on e6, again, my pawn on b3 is immune. So what's he going to do? Um, if king e8, I just pick up all the pawns. In fact, I pick up f6. Well, I don't get that with check, because rook takes, but... Um, yeah, he's... Oh, one thing he's kind of subtly threatening is... So if I do something stupid, uh, I don't even know how to set this up, but, like, um, say I take here, he's got this vague threat of g5, and if I do pawn takes, then this. Although even this doesn't win the bishop for all kinds of reasons, but I was afraid of some of these things during the game. Uh, he played king g8, however, and then, yeah, it's just... Um, we just crunch him at this point. So if he goes king f8, this is check. And um, he did resign at this point. The key point here is that king h8, rook f7 is what I intended. Threatening mate. Stops this mate. And now I threaten mate on h7. And there's no response. Also I threaten bishop g7 mate, which would be a lot cooler, let's be honest. Uh, so you'd have to play this, and then I just take here. So, um, that's all she wrote for that game. Um, so our lesson of that game is, okay, I didn't really have a strong familiarity with the opening and the ideas of um, how I force black to make some concessions so I can... Um, not give up the pawn or give up material without reason. Um, but one thing that's pretty abundantly clear is that my impulsive knight a4 that I played, just because I couldn't, I just freaked out and couldn't keep calculating. I just got really exhausted or tired and I was just running out of ideas. Uh, I just need to be more patient and have more faith. And, um, believe in things like this. And we saw in the line of the game that the rook dances back and forth and the knight, like after c4, um, knight to e1 gets played and white really has to grovel to hold this together, but he can keep his extra pawn um, and then slowly unwind and maybe find a way out and extract some concession from black, but it's going to differ based on what black plays. But yeah, I got very lucky following the opening. My opponent really didn't know how to follow up his strong opening attack. Um, certainly he very well studied how to play to get to this position, but I managed to confuse him, and he hasn't seen this line in quite a while. And, uh, we were in the wild jungle, and somehow in that jungle, tactics happened after this, um, and I just com emerged on top. Yeah, he played e5 and figured he was much better if not winning, um, and what worked out for me is because he believed in this e5, and I had enough belief in my position 
that is willing to give up that exchange on a1 and say you know what um, things look terrible but I actually evaluate or believe that I'm not lost yet whereas he perceived with e5 that he was just simply better and it wasn't that simple he overestimated his um, or just uh, very much misevaluated and okay maybe what contributed to some of that is just seeing that this is very challenging and complex after the line the computer pointed out with queen here queen there rook here uh, it's very complex and not clear at all but black gave up his dark squared bishop for the rook right so of course white's gonna get something for that um, but yeah, he misevaluated. He thought he was just winning this. I don't know on what grounds he thought he was better, but other than, yeah, optically it looks great, but you have to be able to justify, like, how did you earn the win? Wins just don't appear on the board, usually. Usually you have to play some good moves, and your opponent has to mess up in some way. And Okay, yeah, he took my exchange, but I got compensation. I wouldn't have given up the rook for absolutely nothing. Or I, if I had to give up material and I wasn't getting anything for it, and my position was just going downhill and my opponent was playing excellently, I might resign. But, yeah. Um, no, I was just tenacious and I got compensation and that's how that went. It was quite a game. Um... So that was round two. So round one, we played against somebody 500 points lower rated. Round two, we played against the number two seed. And so that's two wins in a row. Um, and at this point, I was just taking a look at the pairings and trying to figure out, gosh, who am I going to get for round three? Because um, I already played the number two seed, and I somehow lucked out and beat him. Uh, even though he played the opening better, he just didn't evaluate correctly after the opening, and I just walloped him just by sheer luck. And round one, um, I managed to win the game after quite a bit of good fortune, too, because certainly I didn't deserve that win. Um, check out uh, the earlier part of the video if you're uh, confused or interested in that. Um, I will upload this later. And now we get round three. And uh, I got paired with somebody, again, 500 rating points lower. And so I got black, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, my opponent's probably a little more tired than I am. Because um, somehow in my round two game, I just got really fortunate and... It did end fairly quickly because my opponent had played pretty quickly. I spent quite a bit of time, but um, my opponent not so much. And I don't know. So I got plenty of time to rest between rounds. Whereas uh, my opponent this round uh, um, spent a few minutes between rounds two and three. Um, but other than that, we just pretty much started on time. And um, kudos to him. I did offer to him, you know, if he wants a few minutes just to rest up before we start, I would completely understand. But no, he said, yeah, let's, let's just get the game on and we'll play. And um, he said a few minutes isn't going to change the result one way or the other. And um, I guess, and again, this is kind of a friendly, casual event. This isn't for a big prize or something. This is a more local uh, event to just try to draw out players and revitalize the chess community in some sense. Um, so, yeah, obviously after uh, round three, people still have things to do with their days and lives and weekends. And so I kind of completely respected that. Um, well, yeah, I'll leave you in suspense a little bit longer if that's okay. Uh, so let's see how this goes, shall we? D4. Okay, 
again I've got to change all my board settings um, let's turn off this computer gauge stuff uh, turn on the move noises and here we go so D4 um, not the most typical choice in my region typically I see people play E4 um, I wasn't expecting d4 from a person with this rating either. Usually you think of d4 being played by somebody who's like a class B or class A player. Um, namely somebody whose rating is somewhere north of... Um, where did they draw those lines again? I guess 16 to 1800 or 1800 to 2000. So. Normally you think uh, stronger players would be playing d4 and um, more beginnerish players would be going for more tactical things that start with e4. And that way they get a chance to play as many tactics and as many end games as possible and not strongly fixate on positional chess, which is highly nuanced and challenging. Uh, tactics can go anybody's way. Um, so I've got d4, I respond with d5, and um, this is what I've been kind of sort of studying up like a couple years ago and then completely forgotten and I'm trying to apply it. Um, I actually got to play a Slav defense. And uh, again, like how many years ago was it? Two or three? Uh, from a local tournament event, I purchased a set of Slav DVDs or CDs um, from a tournament player who was offering these. And Slav actually complements my repertoire pretty well. Because, um, you know, um, I'm looking for something that's kind of murky that's kind of not obviously i don't know something that's fluid but at the same time allows um uh, i don't know i don't even know what to classify the slav as other than just not a queen's gambit declined not a queen's gambit accepted not one of these mainline things it's something where I, if i want I could spend more time studying specific Slav lines, or I could even go into like semi-Slav, or possibly even transpose in some cases, like knight f6, and I don't know what all the openings I can get into are. Um, but there's a lot of ways I can go with this. And with white, to some extent, I've studied the Peerts. Um, so for those unfamiliar, the Pierts goes e4, d6, um, d4, knight f6. And in some lines, black goes ahead and plays c6 here. So a Slav kind of complements this. There's definitely some symmetry going on there, or some, um, some resemblance between the two. So yeah, this uh, I think was a reasonable purchase from a fellow tournament player. Um, I need to go back and actually finish these DVDs and CDs and l actually learn the rest of this, but I was eager to try to apply it and some of it, uh, apply some of it in tournaments, and I've done okay with it in Blitz Chess, but I wanted to put this to the test in a real tournament game and see how it would turn out. Um, so, okay, here we go. Um... So yeah, knight c3. Um, again, this is just main line. When I first saw that this is playable in the Slav, and see that like I can play a gambit and it's not completely refuted, I was like, oh man, this is the best. This is this is amazing. This allows me to take the game into my own hands and out of my opponent's area of expertise. And if I want to. I can study this as much as I've studied um, some of the other gambits I've looked at. And I think that this kind of gambit's pretty enterprising and it avoids, um, it avoids a lot of theory. It avoids a lot of um, uh, 
positions with locked pawns and um, not a lot of piece activity and just slow positional maneuvering games. This dodges all of that and allows me to play some exciting chess. So, yeah, it's fun stuff. Um, all right, so he takes, I attack the knight. This is how the line goes. Um, let me check here, and then I take the pawn. Okay, and white's still plus 0.3 here, right? So this is not like this is winning or anything for black. No, this is just a form of equality. In fact, slightly better for white. But I've played a gambit. I've got a reasonable position. And most importantly, this is not a queen's gambit. This is not something where the pawns are in a very well-recognized, rigid formation where it's obvious where all the targets will be. This is something where peace development is super important, and I actually stand a good chance of outplaying an opponent in this sort of thing. Um, yeah, my opponent hesitated here for several minutes. Um, he's looking at quite a few things. I was looking at knight g3. I really was. And the point is that, sure, this actually starts to resemble an Alyokin, or an Alyokin, as Zug would say it. Um, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm going to assume that Zug says it correctly. Um, but the point is that with the knight on g3, the, he just plays this other knight to f3, and um, s resembles that. Um, or am I imagining that? No, I guess I am imagining that. In the Elyok El and the uh, knights usually maneuver their way over to the queen side, and you'll have this weird formation. Maybe I'm thinking of like a Karokan or something, but there's some formation where the knight ends up on g3 and it's reasonable. There's nothing really wrong with the knight here other than um, if black just plays g6, this knight has difficulty going to f5. G6 is kind of committal, you know, when you don't have an e-pawn. So, perfectly reasonable for white to play that. Um, okay, I guess knight f6 is fine. Um, queen d6, I mean, that makes more sense than giving away the queen. Uh, h5, I, I mean, okay. Yeah, I'll play just about anything. This starts to remind me of a Karo. Uh, I'm kind of surprised that doesn't happen. But anyway, we're way off track here. This is kind of what sort of should have been played, but um, none of Black's moves here are really forced. I mean, Black could play bishop d6, could probably play bishop e6, knight d7, knight a6, knight h6, knight f6. Maybe g6, I don't know. Maybe c5, maybe d3. Anything seems really playable here for black. Um, and some are obviously better than others in various respects. Um, but black is not going to lose this out of the opening. He might get a terrible middle game. He might get a painful end game. But um, this is not something black's going to lose in the opening. And really that's what's most important is that I get something that's not a forced draw, that's not going to be a boring, um, drawn, dull endgame. And I get something where the pawns are fluid and anything can happen. Um, so. Um, oh yeah, you could say that maybe this d4 is maybe premature in some way and black's overextended and uh who knows but yeah knight g3 is totally what i expected f3 caught me very much by surprise um and i think it did very well to meet this accurately so i could just lash out with like knight f6 and just trade off and equalize and that would be okay i could play bishop f5 to hit the knight and again that would be okay um but i was thinking like, what are all the various ways I might want to develop? I might want to put my bishop here. I might want to put it somewhere like c5. So I'm not sure where the bishop's going to go. It could go to any of these squares, c5, d6, or e7. So not looking... Oh, it could also go to g7. Depends really what white does there. 
So I'm not looking to move that right away. Um, bishop to e6 makes a good deal of sense, but then white could play knight g5, and then I've kind of put the bishop out too early. And he's threatening to trade for my bishop, and now I give up the bishop pair, and that's not pleasant. This knight on e4 is really not so well placed. I could play f5 to dislodge the knight, but then we get knight g3 as earlier, or even knight f2. And this is the point he was kind of hoping for, is that after knight f2 and knight d3, this knight really isn't that misplaced. So I don't want to really kick the knight away. If anything, this pawn at f3 is clumsy and prevents knight f3 from happening. So I'm perfectly content to leave this knight and pawn where they are, as long as it prevents white from moving his other pieces. Uh, as long as it complicates white's castling, then it's okay for me to do this. Okay, so we're with me so far, so I don't want to push my f-pawn. Don't know where my bishop's going to go. Don't know, like, I want to put my bishop on e6, but the timing's not right because of knight g5. Um, debated moving my knight out, but again, if knight f6 we just equalize and his pieces trade down, this pawn on d4 might be overextended. So I'm not looking to trade that right away. Uh, so I, as much as I want to play knight f6, now it's just not the time to do it. Pushing the d-pawn obviously loses the pawn. Moving the queen again gives up attacks on the knight. So as much as I might want to go back to, say, c7 and I feel a lot safer there, I don't want to give up pressure that I have on the knight. So that's not moving either. Um, g6 might be a fun thing to move, but I'm not sure whether I'm going to commit my bishop to d6 or g7 just yet. Seems a little overcommittal to push the bishop there. Uh, h5 is completely out because my rook can't lift to h6 because of the bishop. So we've, by process of elimination, so far we've eliminated all these pieces. None of those are moving. Not moving my king, that would be silly. Uh, the rook has really nowhere to go. I mean, okay, yeah, I could push my a-pawn. We're not going to reject the a-pawn push because maybe that is playable. Um, Likewise, I'm not going to reject a b-pawn push, because this actually does gain some space over here. Uh, c5 is tempting, but it encourages b4, so I'm not going to push that yet. So, by process of elimination, gosh, what's left? Um, well, something over here, right? Something in this little quadrant to the board. We've narrowed it down, and the rook can't move right now, so it's a choice between do I move the knight? Or do I push the pawns? And I prefer peace activity. And I want to centralize my knight. And in some way, I wanted to play this like a caro with knight d7 followed by knight gf6. So that was my line of reasoning as to what I went and did there. Uh, so that's actually how I did that line of thought during the game. And you can imagine how long it took me going around in circles, identifying candidate moves, until I finally came up with knight d7. I think it was time well spent. Some may argue that, okay, that might be overkill and any move is fine, but I think knight d7 is the best move in that position. And like a Karo, it allows me to play this knight to f6. Usually in the Karo, you have the pawn on e6, but whatever. Um, and with the knights supporting each other, then it becomes easier to take control of this square. And once I've taken control of that, um, then I control both d4 and e4. And assuming that white doesn't castle, things start to get really ugly really quickly. Um, okay, e3 is played. And, um... We can go through all the tactics here, um, or I could leave the tactics as an exercise for the viewer. Um, that might take a while. But basically, the key point is that if I trade off here, uh, I think, I mean, he doesn't even have to take back right away. He could just play bishop to c3, and I think this is what he was intending. And now d6 is loose. And so I, yeah, I go back, whatever. And I mean, this pawn on e3 just kind of levitates there for a while. 
uh, assuming that white doesn't have some way that he can simply win it. Maybe he does. Maybe queen d3 and then queen takes e3 and it's just not possible to support that. Um, so this pawn takes pawn on e3 just resolves the tension too quickly and makes it really easy for this bishop to go places. Um, also, just like knight f6 again is kind of out. I mean, yeah, it builds pressure on the center, but then he gets to take on d4 and then attack my queen, and that's no fun. Um, so yeah, eventually I came up with the tactical answer, which is f5. And this uh, exploits the fact that if the knight moves away, say if he plays knight to f2, then this is kind of fun for black now, isn't it? Threatening this check, threatening that check. Um, See, so yeah, knight f2 is out. So his original idea of knight f2, knight d3 just no longer really works. Um, so given all that, e3 is something he wants to do, but tactically it's, uh, well, it amounts to a sacrifice. Um, so he takes d4, I back up. Uh, yeah, obviously bishop g5 loses a tempo, and he should just like continue developing. But yeah, his move e3 amounted to sacking a knight. Now, it's not just a sacking a knight for nothing. I mean, he does get a couple pawns for it, and he does get a pre pretty reasonably sized center. And his king's safe, and he's developed faster. But um, I got the knight, so uh, yay me, right? Um, but yeah, he played bishop g5, which is perhaps not the most accurate follow-up. Um, and so yeah, I deliberated, do I want to check him here? Or do I want to block, and if so, which knight do I want to block with? Um, I'm not sure that it matters which knight. Uh, I decided knight gf6. It's probably okay to play either knight there. Queen b4 might be okay as well, but this just seemed really clean because it encourages trading here and trading there and like trading as many pieces as possible. Because I'm up material, I do want to trade. Uh, and I do want to be able to exchange down and win, be it either in a middle game or an end game. Um, so yeah. yeah, taking an f5, uh, wait, you're saying taking e3 in f5? I'm not sure what you're saying that I should take. Um, at any rate, this, yeah, tactically, yeah... White's getting smashed because he played e3 with his king still in the center and my queen lined up with all these pieces here. Um, or maybe a better word is he got shish kebobbed. All the pieces are stuck on this pin here. Ultimately the knight's the last one standing there and then it gets taken. Uh, so he plays knight or bishop d3 which is okay it's a reasonable developing move but he needs to castle as quickly as possible. And so I played this, so I don't need to take the knight. That knight's just gonna sit there. It's gonna sit there and atrophy as long as possible. Um, my point in playing this is that later it allows me, if he goes like bishop h4, I can choose to play g5 when I'm ready, and then so I like say we get here, and now I could play g5, and okay, he's got, he doesn't have this check at all, that's not a thing. But also this bishop has to move away, and then I can take this. And I take this, and then as soon as my knight moves, I have a discovered check, and all the fun stuff happens. Um, whereas if I just, like, instead of playing h6, if I just take right away, um, and then I try to do this, then he trades. And this is not as powerful. Now you could question, well, am I in some way making this easier for my opponent because now he can just take my knight? Maybe that's the case, I'm not sure. But um, what works in my favor here is that now my bishop's a little faster activated. I'm still threatening to take this. And one thing that works in my favor is that now this pawn is still here. 
It's like if I... Uh, I'm still threatening to take, but I haven't yet taken. Um, so he can't, like, for example, play knight f3, pawn e4, pawn e4. Um, he's got to spend a tempo doing something. And he just really doesn't have a whole lot that he can do constructively with that tempo. Um, apparently Stockfish prefers castling kingside to castling queenside. I don't know that it matters. Uh, so yeah, I get the knight. He's got a couple pawns. Uh, oh yeah, now the other point is that because he spent this tempo moving the queen, now I'm able to gain a tempo on the moved queen. And I'm still hitting this here. Right? And then, yeah. Suppose that he moves the queen, or whatever. Suppose he does knight f3. I do have this fun castling move, and I'm hitting the pawn, and... Like, this is really painful for white. But if you think that's painful, just wait until you see the game continuation. It gets better. Um, so he plays queen e3. I check. Uh, at this point, really his only option is to block with the queen, because otherwise I take b2, and I'm forking a1 and g2, and probably threatening all various assortments of checkmates and maybe even getting my bishop out here and checking him in some ways too. So, not white's greatest m moment ever. Uh, queen e3 is probably not so accurate. Maybe queen d2 is better, although queen d2 would, um, queen d2 would give up the pawn. So yeah, knight f3 is kind of forced, although knight f3 is not something he wanted to play, but at this point he doesn't get to choose. Beggars can't be choosers. At this point, he I mean, sure, he doesn't want to get pinned. He doesn't want to trade pieces, but he has no choice in the matter. I'm the one telling him what moves to play at this point. Uh, he's just got to complete uh, his development. Um, now, how do I get that right to tell him what to do? Well, it's because back here, you remember how I said he's got to spend a tempo doing something, right? Um... I guess one thing he could have tried with that tempo was like queen c2. I probably still check him after all this anyway. Um, this is probably still uncomfortable for him. Um, but yeah, back here, this is the moment where he has to find the best move. And since he didn't find this knight e2, or potentially knight h3, I mean, he's got to somehow get this knight away and castle kingside because he doesn't get to castle queenside. He's got to um, involve all of his pieces, and since the only piece that can block on this vector here is the queen, uh, or unless he plays knight e2, in which case maybe he could block with the knight, I don't know, but um, since he's going to need to use the queen to block the check, therefore here he's forced to move the knight, or he just loses a tempo, as he did. So that's how I get to be the one telling him what's going on. And, I'm kind of forcing his moves, and he's in a very reactive mode at the moment. Um, and sure, yeah, okay, I could t trade the queens, but I'd rather keep them on if I could. But I'm also not going to move my queen away trying to avoid a queen trade, unless there's some advantage to me avoiding it, and I didn't see any. Um, here he plays d5, and... I didn't, I wasn't of the opinion during the game that this is just crushing, but after the game, I did quickly look this over with the computer, and it confirmed that, oh yeah, or it rather told me that d5 is just smashing the opponent. I did not believe that one bit. Um, but apparently, yeah, if I just take, in very um, morphe fashion, just the center crumbles, white gets checkmated. It's amazing. Uh, apparently this is best play. I check, and then I just put my knight there, and I mean, the rest solves itself. But that's not what happened. I'm not some Grandmaster Morphe. I'm just me. And just me just plays this queen b6 move, where I see that I'm threatening this. I fully expect it. he's going to castle here. Um, and... All right, I'm sorry, I expect a3, and he does play a3. Uh, a3 is better than castling, because castling is not legal here, um, which I just noticed. 
But also, A3 is better because castling is quite dangerous, uh, even if it were illegal. Uh, I'd be castling into it. Uh, but yeah, I saw this queen b6, which allows me to continue with bishop c5. Perhaps if I hadn't seen this continuation, I might have found back here c takes d5. But this looked so immensely powerfully good for black that I didn't stop to look for anything better. And that's okay. I mean, if you find one way to practically win the game... Okay, you might want to spend a few minutes looking to see if you have something even more forcing and more winning, but you don't have to find every way to win it. Um, you just need to find one good way. Um, yeah, bishop c5 is a good answer here. And so my opponent finally develops his knight. And yeah, he's got to develop, but um, I wonder why knight e2? Uh, I don't get it. Why is that any better? Let me think about that one. It might not matter. I think I was intending bishop e3 in any event. Um, oh, knight e2 blocks along this file. Whereas knight f3 just allows me to continue in true classical style, just Bring out the remaining piece. Smash through the center. Destroy everything. Exterminate, exterminate, etc. But, um... Uh, so he tries to castle out of it. And bishop e3 happens. And I would say that that's all she wrote. But, um... This is actually kind of funny the way it played out. So we're going to finish the game. Uh, so yeah, the king runs. I win the queen. I take e4. I'm just winning material. Uh, I'm threatening c4, and my opponent's playing on for a purpose of seeing, like, how well he can hold out and how well he can play, and I don't fault him for that. Um, given that we've taken it this far, we might as well play it to the end. If this were some difficult exercise where it would take, I don't know, 50 to 100 more moves, then I would fault my opponent for playing it out. Um... But since the game is not going to last an eternity, I have no malice toward him or anything. Um, I don't think that this is um, an error in his play. Although, I would not fault an opponent for resigning here either, just as a matter of preference. So yeah, I'm playing my rook here, trying to do some sneaky tactics and stuff, but also just taking on f3. But what was my sneaky tactic? I don't remember anymore. Uh, there's something really clever. Oh well, maybe it'll occur to me again. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm threatening to take f3, and then if the knight moves, this thing. Yeah, that's pretty great. Um, but no, you expect at this point that I would just take the rook, right? I mean, this wins an exchange. But why stop there? Um... Why well, stop there indeed? Because, yeah, now I'm threatening not just to take the rook and win the exchange. Uh, actually, I guess I can follow with this check and probably some mating threats. But also, if those mating threats don't work out, I'm threatening the knight. And thirdly, I'm threatening queen b3 check. So, yeah, this kind of hurts for white. Um, originally, my big idea was that I was going to play just rook f2 and just pile up and trade everything. Um, Queen e3 was a last minute inspiration and improvement. Uh, I did find it. I spent a little while looking for that instead of just immediately bolting rook f2 out there. So this is pretty cool. Um, yeah, and then we had rook c1, and I checked him here, and then I played rook f1. I mean, it, yeah. You have to play this stuff if you have the opportunity. It's it's most enjoyable to do it. Yeah, this is just a fancy way of checkmating. Stockfish is just a total buzzkill, and it says that it's not the fastest mate sequence, but I don't care. It's the most beautiful mate sequence, and that's what really counts. Um, so yeah, he takes my rook, I take here, 
and yeah, there's nothing he can do. Um, uh, see if he plays rook f3, this is mate. And if he plays pretty much anything else, I just take here and that's mate. Um, so yeah, this is where we shake hands, call it a day. Uh, and I've played one solid game in three whole games of chess. And you could say I got lucky in all three games. Um, but this third one, not only did I get lucky, I actually played some good moves. Uh, rather, I didn't get a lost position out of the opening, unlike the first two games. So one out of three, I managed to play and not get a lost position or a terrible position out of the opening. Um, by terrible, I mean like minus a pawn or two. Um, yeah, I actually exited the opening with advantage, which is really atypical for me. I usually get uh, opening position, and it's usually worse, and then usually I get an unclear middle game, and somehow trade down exactly the right pieces and get an equal to drawish to eventually winning endgame. It's typically how my over-the-board games go. Although games do vary, and sometimes I do get advantages earlier in the game. And sometimes I do get opponents who don't blunder. And those um, make me question why I play competitive chess, because I don't know openings that well in general. Um, don't know a lot of opening tabia. I'm just decently good at end games and really enjoy the adventure and the tactics and the king hunts and. Uh, all the fun adventures that happen. Um, so yeah, with that, yeah, you saw I won games 1, 2, and 3. As such, I had a perfect score, and I did win the tournament. So it was a good weekend, or a good day. Um, so yeah, I think out of that, what are the lessons I have to learn? Um, so I spent some time studying this uh, Slav defense a while ago. This winnower counter gambit's an excellent choice for the unprepared opponent. It's probably something I want to study in further depth to improve upon. Um, if you remember my round two game, we played a Benko. And here, okay, my opponent has probably played the Benko 100 to 1,000 times more than I have. Um, but I played it well enough to not lose the game out of the open. Well, I played it well enough to not lose it, but not deservedly. Like, after knight a4, which is just an impulsive move, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I just learned that I need to be more calm here, more thoughtful, more reflective, and just trust that I'm not losing out of the opening. And that's a hard thing to do especially with openings that I haven't played so much. So I either need to play this more just to get a better grasp of what's going on or study it more or somehow just learn it better. Um, but other than that, just like in general, I need to not panic and um, be able to deal with this kind of absurd tension that happens. Or if I can't take the heat, pick some other opening. Um, like, if I really can't take the Benko, then maybe on c5 do something that isn't a Benko. I mean, that's certainly a possibility. One funny idea that occurred to me during the game is what if I just play b4 here? I laughed it off, but, um, yeah, that's no, actually pretty terrible. Never mind. Although, I'm not sure why, but white's not better there. Um, I wished it were okay. That would have been hilarious. But um, another thing that occurred to me is maybe I just play b4 here. This is probably, you know, Stockfish still doesn't like it. But anyway, um, yeah, if I can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen, basically. If I'm really that afraid of the Benko, um, maybe a symmetrical English is the way to go. Although, this doesn't always go into the English either. I mean, it can go into the Slav and all this fun stuff. and This might not be something I want to play either. Um, so I need to figure out what I'm going to do with my repertoire there. 
it's probably going to be the Benko. I just need to get more familiar with it and trust that it's okay. Um, and yeah, just go into the Benko. It's it's worth doing some studying and better appreciating it, but it's a good opening for white. It just takes a lot of patience and a lot of self-trust, and that's something that can be developed. Um, as for round one, how did this thing go again? Oh. Uh, yeah, we got into an exchange Slav. I mean, sometimes you're going to get an opponent who has no ambition and no soul and just doesn't want to play an interesting game at all. So for that kind of opponent, I need to have a better uh, op uh, tournament repertoire. Because unlike round three, where I got the opening I was aiming for, this time I didn't. And so I need to have something prepared for somebody who's rated roughly 500 points rate lower than I am. Um, otherwise, we get these kinds of uh, drawish exchange slav things that um, can go anybody's way if I try to push and force the win. Because you can't force a win in every opening. Um, so I need to pick some alternative to meet the English. I can't just rely on what I knew back in high school, which is just the uh, symmetrical English. And I'm not very keen on the idea of playing a reverse Sicilian. Um, so I need to have something prepared for lower rated opponents that isn't the exchange Slav. Because against people closer to my rating, I'm okay with doing this, but giving the rating disparity, um, and not because of um, any rating implication, but because the way pairings work, um, I'm going to get paired up with higher rated players later on in the event. So that's why I keep saying rating, but what I really mean is that out of the people in this event, I'm much... Um, I need to take my chances against some players because other players I might not be able to dictate the pace of the game as well. I'm not saying that the lower rated player is worse, I'm saying that the higher rated player is less likely to let me decide which way the game goes. Um, now it could be that somebody with a low rating just is just awesome and knows all their stuff and has been practicing and getting ready and is going to completely outperform and okay that happens from time to time um, but no I need to have something ready when I'm paired like as the top seed against people who are closer to the bottom seed because in rounds where I'm paired against people close to my own seeding or above uh, it's far more difficult to uh, dictate which way the game goes and therefore, I have to take really high risks against um, low-seeded players. I'm sorry, against um, low-rating, high-seeded players. So that's what I need to learn here, is that I have to have something prepared against my own opening. And unfortunately, I do kind of believe in the English, so preparing something against it's a little bit tricky. Uh, Knight of Six is okay, but... How I followed this with c6 and d5 didn't quite work out the way I wanted. So, especially, um, I wasn't expecting g3 either. So maybe I do need to like study a Nimzo Indian or Bogo Indian or something that involves e6. Um, just to avoid the exchange Slav altogether. Maybe a Queen's Indian, that could be fun. I don't know how that works against the English, but some kind of Indian-ish setup would be fun and complicated. Um, I just want to avoid the exchange Slav. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for the offer there. Um, it could be fun, but... Um, I don't know, I'm not really gearing up immediately to go back into a competitive event right at the moment. There's so many dozens of things that are higher on my list than memorizing or practicing openings, but these are my priorities when I do want to go back into the scene. 
these are things I do need to improve upon, but I just also need to give it some time and be patient with it and have some fun. Um, because there's more to life than competitive chess. Chess can be fun too. Um, but yeah, these are f sorts of things I need to study and practice to be ready for next time. Um, that said, I hope that some of this has been in some way instructive, if not entertaining. And um, thanks for stopping by, and I uh, hope to see you next time. So take care.